Hey everyone, welcome to the NX show. I'm here with Jack. Jack, how are you doing, sir? Hi, good, good, good. Uh, it's been a while since I've been on the show. I know. I think I was here for the last time you were on the show. Maybe. Maybe you yeah, had one with Brandon so. since then? I don't know. Yeah, I had one with Brandon last year probably, and then maybe one with you, and I think that was it in the last year. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, I'm glad I, we got to get you on again. Uh, I've got uh, Sharon on the screen a article that we recently put out uh, from Emily, one of our engineers here at Narwhal. I'm posting a link to the article now in the chat if you want to follow along. Uh, we're talking today about sharing code between React Web and React Native Mobile with NX. And Emily wrote this article out. Uh, we'll, we'll be going through it a little bit and uh, looking at how we can maximize code reuse between uh, web apps and native apps and yeah, how we can uh, leverage NX to do some of that stuff. So before we get into that, though, um, Jack is, is sort of like our resident React expert. I'm always interested in getting your opinions on stuff around React. So I've been I've been going into React more myself uh, with the uh, you know the the stuff I do personally, and um, yeah, I've been I've been exploring things with NX, uh, how to use React in NX and one of the things that's interesting coming from more of like an angular background is you know in, in angular we have uh, kind of like a very discreet uh, like piece of the framework like the ng mm -hmm. module that 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 really makes sense for well what should a library be well a library should be one ng module um, react we don't really have that it's kind of like you were saying mm -hmm. uh, before we start you can kind of do what you want mm -hmm. so it's interesting. It's interesting to me to see like where where should I draw those boundaries around my libs to get the most out of, you know, a mono repo when I'm doing something in React. So yeah, I'd be interested if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, like you said, uh, with React, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Although I guess in the last little while, like I would say in the last two three years at least, uh, there's been more consensus on how we should form. Our modules, how we should build our components. Like you recall from before, there's a lot of talk about like presentational versus smart components, or like connected versus unconnected, especially in the context of Redux or some kind of state management library. Um, and I don't know, I'm not saying this pattern is good or bad. I think it's just the more widely accepted one now, where it doesn't really matter if your component is smart or bad, or it's like <laughs> smart or not. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but basically, like you want to form your module boundary around your components. Right, so mm. if, even if your components lazily loaded, um, it doesn't really matter. It's like that's like more of an implementation detail. So like you have a component that you build out, you load it in your app, and then that component just brings in whatever it needs. So what it may connect to the network, it may not. Uh, it doesn't really matter um, as long as like the public API is sound or like it's well defined, and you mm -hmm. don't have to consume it. That's all that really matters. So in terms of like how you would structure your app and structure your modules. Um, there isn't like this concept of a module the same way that you think about Angular modules, I think. Yeah. Um, but you can form your own abstractions. Like a lot of the stuff with lazy loading, like you can import a dynamic module or a component, use React Suspense and stuff like that to load it. Um, like those are the kind of things that React does provide you with. And I think a lot of that has merit, like even with, um, I guess more recently with Angular, they're talking about like single uh, component Angular modules, right? Mm -hmm. Where I don't want to import this big module, I just want to really use one component. And I think React is built perfectly for that. We just think yeah. about components, you don't think about anything else. It's like everything's a component. Right. So you, you, you think like um, it would be perfectly reasonable to have like a library with just the one component. Um, in like a yeah. React mono repo, you think? Yeah, and, and we, we've been debating this too, like, because um, I think a lot of our examples show you create a UI library, right? Mm -hmm. But that library is not very well defined because like, what is a UI library exactly? Uh, yeah, like you can probably say, oh, it's presentational. There's no, uh, like, not much logic in there. Um, but like, it's a button in the UI library. If it is, it's a header. It's a footer. It's a date picker in the UI library because you can imagine date picker is probably a lot more complicated than right. a button, right? Um, so I think it, it's actually worth <coughs> picking out a lot of these what we call like presentational module into more uh, like 
divided by concern. So like date picker mm. doesn't matter too much whether it has state or not. Does it only render props? It's more important to think about like what is the actual public API? Because I don't care if it uses state eternally. That's not uh, really what I like. What I think about when I'm using date picker. What I care about is like um, how does it render accessibility? Uh, does it provide those kind of affordances? Um, and the implementation detail doesn't really matter. And personally, for me, like when I think about presentation component, uh, like as an image, like the actual DOM element image, is that a presentation component? Because it probably is. That's how you think about it. But it does yeah. make a network request and has some kind of like on error handling and stuff like that. So there are some behavior in there that we don't typically think of as presentational. Um, so I think in the React world, that's just not really super helpful way of thinking about it. Hmm. Um, that being said, like, I think it's still what we usually talk about, like feature versus UI, I think still has some usage here, meaning like um, a feature library is more a group of different components and UI and all these other libraries that you have in your workspace, and they compose one useful feature in your app, right? So right. like a shopping cart feature, like I'm not going to build, I'm not going to think about shopping cart as like one giant component. I'm thinking about shopping cart more as uh, in 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 the in like I'm considering it in the context of the user workflow, not so much like what is this shopping cart component gonna do. Um, so I think there's still some differentiation there between like feature versus UI modules, but how you break down UI modules, I think is maybe worth reconsidering. Yeah. So like the I think the way we we advise people to do it in you know the the book we the books we've put out is to separate things into like UI and then uh, like stores uh, for for storing data and for managing data on a client and then the the feature always seems like um, like some um, it, it, we can almost think of it as a box and we're filling it in with. Uh, the stores, the relevant stores, and the relevant UI components, and then saying, okay, this is a feature, <laughs> and, and shipping that out. Is that is that kind of how you would think of it then, or um, is is yeah. it is? Are you talking more about like there's there's not a helpful distinction between a feature and a UI? Oh, I I don't mean that specifically, and, okay. and this is a lot of things that I thought about. So maybe not everything completely makes sense. Um, <laughs> That's but fine. What I think is more like if you look at what React actually provides you with, right? So you can mm -hmm. render uh, some kind of element, like a React element, and also mm -hmm. gives you hooks and stuff. So when you think about hooks, whether it's using effect, using state, using uh, reducer, I don't think it's so useful in the React world to say like, I forbid you from using these things in your in your UI library, just because mm -hmm. I have this notion of like a UI library should be pure. It shouldn't have any side effects. Like, I don't think it's bad to do it that way, but maybe it's worth reconsidering. Like, if my date picker is just not useful without having some sort of state, having um, like effectful computation, is it worth breaking that into like a UI library for just the pure presentational part, and mm. then layering on top like some kind of feature uh, library to take the UI presentational library and then add the actual behaviors you want. Or maybe it's better just to have one library that's just concerned with date pickers. Um, and then who cares like what it uses underneath the hood, uh, as long as like that one, um, I guess, abstraction is useful as a whole. Right, that makes sense. And I think what, yeah, I don't know. We can get a lot more into it, but like a lot of the hooks and stuff, if you think about like the Redux Dux pattern where it's not so much like UI versus um, Redux state versus whatever effect management library you want to use with uh, with Redux. Maybe mm. everything should just be part of the same module, right? So they call mm. it like Dux. Although in Dux, I guess you would leave out the UI part, but everything else comes together because that set of functions slash, um, I guess, utility stuff, like they form one useful group of feature inside your application. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, I'd be interested in going maybe like uh, deeper into like the the date picker uh, example you put up. Um, yeah. Just the uh, so so would the idea for a presentational component be that you sh you shouldn't use like a a use state hook? 
Would, would that uh, be the uh, idea? I, I wouldn't say so. Like, I think people may bring it, like, they take the concept of having a pure cup owner, br- maybe bring it too far. Hmm. Like, if you think about, like, a checkbox, right? Like, is a checkbox really useful without some kind of state? Like, if, they, if the checkbox cannot even maintain its own checked state, then I think it's not super useful. Uh, mm-hmm. Because whatever, um, whenever you need to use a checkbox, you need to have a parent state that pushes uh, the value like checked true or false down to the checkbox. Right. Um, versus, for the most part, I think you you don't care what it does, but what you care about is when the state changes, right? So mm-hmm. if the local or internal state of the component changes, I want to be notified via some kind of callback. Uh, right. I don't care so much about managing your state for you. And then there are some use cases where you actually want to push a state down to it. Uh, and maybe we can talk about date pickers and stuff, because uh, I think that's kind of interesting, like how you design your libraries uh, around different use cases. Yeah. Yeah, the the way I've done forms with React before is um, like you, you, you allow a value to get passed in. And then you just have like a changes callback that you pass in as well. So that, that changes is going to like react to any changes that happen inside the form. But then I'm always using like um, use state on the inside of the of the component. And that's how like whenever the the on change event happens from like the native HTML element, that's where I just call the callback. So I, I call the set state from the use state hook, and then also call the changes callback, and that that allows it to bubble up while also maintaining its internal state. Yeah, so. I think that's the right way to do it. Like, there were a lot of people, including myself, that used to have like try to push too much state into the global uh, like Redux state, right? Yeah, and that way of doing it can lead to certain side effects. For example. If you have a search box and then you're doing autocomplete on the results, um, anything reacting to the state changes will be slower than if you just relied on the actual internal state of the input. Because mm. now if I type, if I, um, I don't know, did a key down or a key up or a key press, yeah. now that has to go through Redux, like the whole cycle, yeah. before it gets eventually pushed down to the UI. Uh, right. So to the user, they can actually tell a difference. Like it's going to be laggy and it's going to be not as responsive, and the mm-hmm. experience suffers as a result. Yeah, yeah. So, so just to just to recap there, like the um, the example I had was very localized to the to the form component. I think the one of the examples you're pointing at it would be rather than having like the on changes callback as part of the form. Um, instead, the w- would the idea be that the the form would dispatch some action that would go all the way up to like the global Redux state and then push that back down uh, via yeah. inputs to the component. I think in in this case, it's not so much about syncing up um, the UI state with the Redux state. It's more mm-hmm. the UI yes will dispatch some kind of action when the things change, and that will affect the result, but it doesn't affect the value of the input, right? So I should type in right. the value of the input is not connected to anything. Like Redux state has nothing to do with it. Um, but uh, the, the the output, that is the change event, I guess, on mm-hmm. the input does affect the Redux state potentially. Right. Yeah, I, w- I would think that like uh, connecting this with some global state management would look something like um, just instead of like um, when you listen to that changes callback, uh, bubbling up from the child form, I think you'd you just dispatch the action based off that observed changed, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, yeah, don't be, I guess, too <laughs> smart about it. Like, yeah, <laughs> just use use DOM for what it is, and uh, yeah. yeah. Well, forms can get really tricky here, and like, I, working with Angular forms a good bit is like it's kind of refreshing to come into React where there's no API. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you still see some of the same problems come up where it's like you've, you've got to keep these things in sync between the DOM and between your your JavaScript state that you're managing as well, which is like so, yeah. an interesting problem. It feels like it should be there. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's interesting. Um, but yeah, let's... Uh, well, um, before, before we go on to that, I'd, I'd be interested in sort of in this vein too... Um, so like the the way we the way that uh, Emily's structured her uh, 
workspace. Let me see if I can find the graph that we can put it on screen here. Let me make this a little shorter so we can uh, see it all. So, so this is sort of the the graph that Emily had when at this point it's just a, a web app. So there's no there's no uh, native piece to it yet. I believe this is you know just using our our NX Def Graph tool that we have with NX. So you can see she's got the the application right here. There's an end to end uh, thing. I guess that's using Cypress to to do end to end testing, and then the the web app itself. Uh, has a dependency on a store and on a models. So models is TS models and store. I imagine that's for like holding the the information uh, that she's going to be querying inside of her, her search engine. And then services, uh, I imagine this is like almost like the, the repo level thing, uh, right? Where, where we're actually going out and making the HTTP requests. So, um, I, I guess the way this is handled, like we don't see UI components here. I imagine they're all inside of the application itself, right? So, mm -hmm. um, is uh, typically is this is this what you would, you think you would advise for folks? Uh, I mean, it, it's hard to say. Like one way, one setup applies to every single use case, or. Uh, or one setup is better than the other. I think it depends on the team and the org of how, how they structure their work. Um, hmm. In general, like we preach uh, like for the apps, for them to remain as small as possible. So they're mostly just piecing together different things. Right. And in this case, I, I would uh, probably break down the app into like smaller components that can be pieced together, especially in the context of like if you do want to reuse anything between uh, the web and um, native. Yeah. Um, you probably don't want like everything to live in your apps. Right. Well, I think maybe um, what what the the article is set up to do is I, I'm I'm speaking ad because I've read the whole article, but uh, <laughs> essentially we we bring in like the native. Uh, we create a new native web app, and we just reuse all the uh, all the same libraries that that we were used in the web app. So I guess the, the components pieces are then managed inside of the native and the web pieces themselves. Yeah, and so. I think this is where uh, you have to apply your own, like uh, I guess, requirements on top of NX. So NX mm -hmm. comes out with a bunch of things out of the box that we recommend. Mm -hmm. And even things like uh, small app shells, stuff like that, you don't have to do it that way. Like if you choose Next.js, for example, your pages have to be inside your app. You can't say like, oh, pull your pages just because NX tells you you should have a feature library and stuff. But what we can do is keep the pages uh, a little bit smaller. So anything that's too, um, has a lot of logic or has a lot of uh, components, maybe you can extract that into a library, right? And mm -hmm. that's actually how we build up the NX.dev site. It's like, of course you have pages because that's the way NX, uh, sorry, Next.js functions. <laughs> Yeah, you can you can still extract those libraries out of the things. So here, I think there's a balance of like, especially when you're coming up with a demo app, like mm -hmm. how much do you want to try and mimic a real world example versus showing right. something simple? Because the simplest thing is just to keep everything in your app, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you, you can't really pretend that it's a real world example. Like, there's no real world example that's just a small demo. Like, you really have to. <laughs> Build out a real world example to see how it's yeah. supposed to work together. Well, I, I mean, I, I served up Emily's application here. It looks pretty like full featured. Like it looks like this could yeah. legitimately be out there as, as a real thing. So I, mean, I don't want to cheapen that. Uh, there, I think there is something to be said for like having everything in the app and then like pushing down when you want to share. Like I, I know that's not what we recommend, but I, I have had some good success with that in the past, which. Uh, like just uh, when we when I first got started with NX, I guess that was the first when it just got released. That was kind of the the uh, approach we had taken at, at my previous organization because we didn't know any better. <laughs> but uh, like it, it worked out pretty well, and it it, it actually helped us um, like kind of sculpt the the workspace into what we needed it to be mm -hmm. um, without like um, yeah. You know, maybe over engineering the libraries a little bit to get it just perfect, right? Yeah, there, there's the, I guess you can do it too much. Like 
mm. it meaning breaking into smaller modules or smaller libraries. Like you can't take it too far where every single component is a library. Then yeah. like your graph is gonna be giant and like yeah. it's gonna be hard to uh, figure out like who's using what, whatever, especially if everything's flat. Like you probably want to at least have some logical grouping of things. Like uh, mm -hmm. anything that's maybe uh, concerned with forms to maybe inside be inside a single forms library, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of you having like button forms, like I don't know, uh, like um, field, like they shouldn't all be in their in their own library. They should be probably in a forms library. Mm -hmm. uh, but specifically for like small apps, especially this one, I don't think it's like huge. Um, is it really worth taking an app that really has one or two pages and making it into like a bunch of different libraries all over like like maybe not <laughs> yeah know? yeah definitely yeah um i think i actually i actually brought up a very similar um point in like the when we did the nx conf in my in my talk there about like how where's where's like the goldilocks zone for for how to do libraries in your nx workspace mm. and like the yeah I think I explored the two extremes and one of them is just like your, your, your graph is just the one node, right? Like that's, that's kind of like a valid workspace too. But then the, the other extreme is just like the uh, chaos. You can't, you can't see it all. Probably the graph makes sense if you can get to it, but every, if everything's a, if every component's a lib or if, even uh, if every function's a lib, that's kind of possible too. Like you can go crazy with this. So. And I think when it comes to like grouping of components or uh, sorry, grouping of libraries and mm -hmm. what should be extracted, like even if you broke everything down to libraries, right? Mm -hmm. And if you run the depth graph and it comes out and everything points to each other, like even though you're like, oh, I technically broke everything into feature libraries, UI libraries, but everything points to each other and there's no like hierarchy between them. Uh, I yeah. think that's also not very good. Uh, the, the way I like to think about it is like, if I need to delete a feature, how easily can I do it? Like, mm. can I just go to a feature library, just press delete, uh, and then maybe delete the route <laughs> from the app? Or do I have to go through and like change this, change that, delete this, and then figure out like, oh, who's, who's using this? Can I delete it? Then yeah. it's probably not structured properly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, one of the points I made in my talk too is if, if you think of like the bell curve, uh, representing sort of what that Goldilocks zone is. Mm -hmm. I think um, some of the tooling we have in NX lets you like shift that bell curve a little bit to the left. So like maybe if otherwise you would have liked your libraries a bit larger, um, just because you have the generators and stuff set up mm -hmm. with NX to, to be able to automate a lot of that, you know, the code gen for you. Maybe you can make look to make your libraries a little bit smaller than you otherwise would. So. That's that was like one of the pieces of advice I gave. I think the other piece is just like when, when you're thinking about a library, just think of it as almost like um, like an npm package that happens to live inside of your inside of your workspace. So if it makes sense to break something out to like a package, it probably makes sense to break it out to a to a lib. So yeah, yeah that's I think that's that falls a good way in line. Thinking about it, yeah, yeah, I think that falls in line with what you're saying. So yeah, um, we can see here. I, I guess from the from the depth graph we have. Um, so the w before I read Emily's article, what I assumed would happen is we would be able to share a lot of the UI components, and the services would have to change because I had assumed we wouldn't be able to use like the uh, the same uh, method to make network requests. And reading Emily's article, I was completely wrong. <laughs> it's like we we actually uh, the pieces that we can't reuse are the UI pieces because um, React Native is not just a web view. It's actual like you're actually building uh, something different in terms of your. Uh, I guess we're not even in the DOM anymore, but something yeah. DOM like that works in in a native context. But the, mm -hmm. the services we're actually able to largely reuse um, as long as we have some mm -hmm. config to allow you know the network requests to happen. So yeah. I, and I see I see Ben in the comments here. So yeah, Ben, <laughs> nice to see you. 
<laughs> and yeah, to, to Ben's point too. So, so sometimes with the we were talking about the depth graph kind of being too cluttered sometimes, but the a, a lot of the tools that we have inside of the the depth graph now kind of allow us to uh, to to make things uh, like I said, shift things to the left because we can still filter and like cut down uh, the amount of clutter if we're focusing on one thing inside mm -hmm. of our depth graph to make it still like human comprehensible. So. Yeah. But yeah. Sorry. And, Let's <laughs> go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> it's on depth graph too. Like uh, we we saw internally some experiments. I guess Philip is working on with the depth graph, mm -hmm. and they they're pretty cool. Like how to, uh, I guess, visualize your workspace better, especially when it comes to, like, if I have a feature or several features and how they connect to the application. I think understanding that is very important. Um, but go going to like reusing UI for React Native versus the web. I think there's a, there's like there are two camps of people, right? When they do both React Native and the web. Like one is you have completely separate UI. Um, so you basically have to maintain two sets of components, right? And there's the other camp where it's basically let's try to share or reuse as much as possible. Hmm. And the only way to do the latter um, or the only same way, in my opinion, is you have to use React Native as a building uh, block. So meaning you consider native first. And I think for a lot of companies, this actually has a huge advantage because how many people, how many end users actually use your app on the desktop anymore? Like once the last time you pulled up Uber on your desktop, you're like, let me call a cab. I don't even know if that's possible. I like, like using the desktop app for a lot of these things, but yeah, I, really? I think I see your point. I think I'm in the minority there that like my um, laptop everywhere. Yeah, I mean, like for me, I would just pull up Uber Eats or something on my phone. Like I'm not gonna go on the desktop, even though I know you could. So hmm. for them, uh, I don't know their numbers, obviously, but I would venture a guess that the majority of their users probably use their mobile app, right? So for them, it's actually better for the company to consider only the mobile app first. And then the web is basically a ported version of the mobile app uh, versus I think a lot of times in more traditional spa plus mobile app, you're thinking the other way, right? Mm. Like you build up your web app first and the mobile is kind of like, okay, we need to put some features on the mobile. How do we do that? And uh, what is the other is if you have like something like Cordova, which is like not really native, it's uh, running stuff in web view. And it's, I think it's better now, but like in the past, it's, it's been very, very slow. Um, especially when it comes to animations and stuff. Um, and you touched on this earlier too. With React Native, you're basically not really, it's really different from like React DOM because the target is not the DOM, right? Mm. So, so React itself, like the core of React, uh, manages like how to update components and stuff. But uh, when it outputs, it's actually talking through a JS bridge or a web view bridge to actual native uh, UI. So it's a very, very different way to do it than like something like Cordova. And right. even like animations, uh, it can run animation natively. So it doesn't block like the main JS thread. And that leads to like a more fluid experience. Um, I know people always throw around like 60 frames per second as a target. And with React Native, you can easily achieve that. Um, yeah. With a JS app that's ported to the web, uh, it may not be as easy, right? Because you are losing a lot of things that you get for free uh, with React Native or with native APIs. Uh, so anyway, so consider the, the, the native app first, and then you can <laughs> use this thing called React Native Web, which basically re-implements the entire, well, not the entire, but like the majority of the React Native APIs, but on top of the, the, the DOM. So you can, basically build most of the components to be reusable and then just uh, through like a Babel transform, whenever you, re when, whenever you import from React Native, it will actually rewrite that import to be from React Native Web. Hmm. I think this is how Uber does it. They have like a uh, bunch of like React Native uh, components and they just use this one library to transform it for the web. Right, interesting. So it's a little bit different approach than um, what Emily took here. Both yeah, I guess Emily took more of a web. Well, at least the art, the way the article plays out, it looks like a web first, and then we kind of port that over to native. Um, so yeah, I'll, let me show the the graph for this, so we can like th this is actually um, Emily's uh, 
workspace clone down and just using the uh, the depth graph command to open you know the the interactive depth graph. So right right now I have it showing all of the projects. And we can see um, sort of as we hover, we can see the uh, the edges of the graph and what are actually affected by um, uh, by each uh, node. Um, and I think by filtering down or by focusing on one, we can sort of see uh, if all we're concerned about is the the uh, web app here, for example, mm -hmm. we, we can kind of filter down to the, the graph we were looking at before. Um, but if we want to take a more holistic view, we can kind of uh, escape that and go see everything or maybe focus on the mobile instead and can see how that graph plays mm -hmm. out. So kind of like uh, Ben's Ben's commenting here in the in the chat, but yeah, the, the we uh, Philip's been doing a lot of awesome work on the on the depth graph, and I think it really helps us in terms of like we said, <laughs> shifting that bell curve a little bit to the left, so you can have you know smaller uh, smaller libraries uh, or or and more of them uh, while still like getting the getting the cognitive benefits of you know seeing how you're your depth graph looks. Um, let me just look through the comments here too. Uh, Evan, good to see you, sir. Uh, is saying that his side projects graph is really large, but not out of control. I went all in on single component modules, and I think Evan uses Angular. So yeah, he's he's going into like the scam, the single component Angular module, and each one is a lib. But I didn't make all my component, all my UI components libs. They're bundled, so. Cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rex Yi saying following domain driven design is one way to vertically slice an application into self contained libraries, preventing huge graphs. So so this is this is maybe an interesting point. Um, domain driven design, I suppose this would be more um, like slicing an app vertically into uh, the features like we were talking about, and maybe sharing some UI pieces in between, and maybe sharing some store pieces in between. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah have you the, the whole DDD thing is interesting, right? Like, because um, yeah. I, I think when you come when you talk about DDD in the context of maybe React specifically, uh, it kind of at least the way that I've seen it implemented encourages you to take uh, extract out a lot of the domain concerns. From the mm. app because you have a domain layer and then you have your app layer right could you, could you define maybe jack what a domain concern is sure so like if you split your application to uh, specific concerns like uh, authentication versus identity um, those could be two different domains there's mm -hmm. one you're talking about how do i authenticate users what is how do i identify users in most apps they're probably the same but anyway uh and then you can also identify other things like if you're running a I don't know, uh, eShop. So you have your shopping cart, that's one domain. Um, mm -hmm. You can have like another one to do what product catalogs. Um, and the way I've seen it implemented before, it's like you have your domain concerns kind of inside uh, Redux or some other state management library. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you can have a headless uh, behavior to it, right? And the UI really just layers on top. Yeah, so the UI is just have, like a way to get to the to dispatch your actions that you want to happen. Yeah, exactly. And I, I actually worked on a real app that does this. Uh, so it was React, React Native, and then the, the main part, which is a mm -hmm. core, um, can operate no matter which framework you're on. So technically, mm -hmm. you can use Angular and other things, uh, even though like I think for a lot of frameworks, you may not use Redux, or at least it's kind of awkward. Yeah. Uh, but like the, the the core of it, the domain part is completely separate from the UI or the application layer. So the React Native app is actually very very small. It really just composes comprises of like some native uh, components, and then same with the web app. It just uses React DOM, and then uh, the meat of the application is actually on the domain side. Yeah. That's interesting. I feel like that's almost like I, I suppose we call it domain driven design, but in my mind it's almost like the uh taking a state management centric view of an application. Because uh, kinda like you said, you can you can uh create the core of your app being part of your state management, but then you can just substitute out uh different UIs. Like in in the case we're looking at here, um 
where we have the we're, we're seeing the whole graph um the we can kind of switch out whether whether we're using a web view or whether we're using react native for the ui but the right. the, the core stays the same right um, and like if you imagine for some reason you decided to add a cli app to this right mm. so you can add another like <laughs> studio ghibli search engine cli for the for the power user <laughs> right? for some reason like if you like pain for some reason uh, <laughs> but essentially you could probably wrap a lot of these things because mm. even stuff mm. like fetch like the fetch api exists in node 17 now with the uh, experimental flag or mm. if you want to polyfill you can use like node fetch right right so probably, like the for the most part store models and services would remain the same but like what you layer on top of it which is your ui um, will be in cli instead yeah yeah that's interesting so like the, we could have a web, we could have a native, and we could have a CLI. <laughs> they would all yeah. use the the same store models and services. It just kind of instead of putting a nice uh, graphical UI, we could put like a CLI based thing on yeah, top. Yeah, I mean you can still use like emojis and some other tricks and stuff to make it maybe more <laughs> user friendly. But I don't know. I yeah, emojis. I, whatever <laughs> I think user friendly, I think emojis. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those are the CLI, and we're good to go. Yeah. But yeah, that's yeah, that's an interesting thought about this. You know, the, some of this is coming up with um, you know some of the work John and I are doing on NX Console right now mm -hmm. because like we're we're kind of interacting between um, you know the the VS Code a APIs that mm -hmm. that are there. And it's like exploring ways, maybe we're thinking of like ways of supporting different IDEs. If we could kind of do something similar, split out the the core of the feature to then work with, you know, the VS Code API and the VS Code UIs versus then maybe uh, looking at bringing that into WebStorm or maybe like a, a desktop app uh, at some point. Yeah, right. So like the NS Console project is, I mm -hmm. think, a good candidate for some architecture architecture like this, right? Yeah. Because the meat of it when it talks to Annex and stuff, that's not really dependent on the UI. Um, mm -hmm. The UI is really just presenting those info to the user. So uh, I forget how it's structured now, but last time I talked to John, I think it's like, it's fairly extracted from like, or it's fairly decoupled mm -hmm. from uh, the UI concerns, like when it talks, when it comes to um, talking to Annex and the logic around it. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 fairly decoupled. I think it could be a little bit more so, um, but but yeah, I think I think it's it's it does um, it's it's uh, kind of in that realm right now. Um, you you can tell, yeah. for example, uh, looking in the code like this. This started out when uh, when Dan was in it. He was working at on it as a desktop app initially, and then we migrated it over to to the VS Code plugin. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see some of the fingerprints of that still in the in the code base. Um, right. And because we had some of that uh, uh, architecture in place, uh, migrating it from the desktop to the uh, to the VS Code wasn't, like it wasn't a rewrite, right? It was just uh, mm -hmm. adding another UI at first and then deprecating the old one. But, right. but yeah, that, that's, that makes it, uh, you know, uh, the, there's benefits there. Like this, this is uh, when I think of this stuff, I go back to like the gang of four patterns, and you know, this is like kind of the adapter mm -hmm. pattern, uh, really. Where well, we we have our we have our core inside of our store, really. I think that's that's where most of this stuff is happening, yeah. and then we we can plug into that, you know, either either kind of UI. So, yeah. So I think like this pattern that you're showing here uh, with store model services. If you mm -hmm. think about like the domain part, I think it's it is able to extract that and share it. Um, I think the React Native platform itself, or the React Native framework. So a platform is confusing because platform, I guess, refers to like mobile, Android, iOS, or web, or even like Apple TV and stuff. So anyway, the React Native framework provides some affordances that are maybe not as of, like available if you use other frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, for example. Like it, you could technically have one library that can render both on the web and mobile, right? And mm -hmm. there's several ways you can go about it. But one neat thing with React Native, it's it actually supports file extensions. Uh, if you name it something like .native.tsx or uh, .android.tsx, like it would actually substitute what the original file was with what 
that specific implementation for that platform. So okay. you can basically create like, for example, um, like an icon component and have three different files, one for web, one for iOS, one for Android. And uh, the React Native bundler will just be able to detect like, OK, this is on the Android platform, so I'm going to pull on the Android icon. I'm on the web platforms. I'm going to pull in the web one. So yeah, several ways to go about it. The other way you could do it is like, um, I guess more of a platform check during runtime. So like, you can import uh, this utility called platform and check what OS is running on. Right. Very cool. Um, well, I, I want to get back to to Emily's uh, article a little bit. Um, just. Uh, because the, this this piece was interesting to me, like like I mentioned, um, the thought the pieces I thought we could uh, maintain versus the pieces I thought we could we couldn't are, were like mm -hmm. flipped. So like the the big piece I think was was the UI, and we've we've talked about that a good bit now. Where um, you know for for a native view, we we actually uh, have to write completely different components. Um, it, we can still use the same store and the same core of our logic, but. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll have to create uh, different versions for for uh, native counterparts to our web views. Um, another piece I thought was interesting was the routing. And I, I didn't mm -hmm. go into this very deeply with the code, but um, is the, the way Emily describes it here, it's like uh, we use one package for web, we use the other yep. package for mobile. Are the, are the APIs to these packages pretty much the same, Jack? No, they're, they're different. Um, okay. You can't easily change between them like you'll have to i mean the the good thing is that you probably just have one section in your application mm -hmm. that consumes these uh libraries so it's not hard to jump between them but yeah. that being said like there there is a way you can use um the same routing solution for both the native and uh for web mm -hmm. but it, it does require some i guess additional thinking additional configuration like if you just have nx out of the box in generate a web app Yes, it's not going to work. Uh, like you can't share code between the web app and the React Native app. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you did a little bit of work, you could get it to at least share something uh, with some caveats, right? So it's not completely you can't share anything. It's more, uh, yes, you can share stuff, but here are some other things you have to know. Yeah, yeah. So, so the way the way you would maybe work that out is if you had your own uh, data structure that kind of described routing for your application, and then you you write like um, a different adapter to to take that uh, the same data uh, for either app, but with one you would you would attach it to the to the React Router DOM API versus the other for native. Is is that maybe how it would work? Yeah. And I think you have to think about routing a little bit differently between the two worlds. And granted, okay. I haven't done real React Native app development for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but like React, sorry, the React, uh, React Router DOM is component-based, meaning even their non-component API is really just a wrapper around their components. Okay. Uh, with most other like routing solution, they're not really component-based. So I think you can't really jump between one or the other super easily. Like you have to think about how you want to structure your app. Um, and on, on on the React Native side, you're not thinking about routes, right? You're actually thinking about screens. Like yeah. What are screens are here? Are they stacked on top of each other? How they transition and stuff? That's a lot yeah. more important. Uh, for a web app, I don't think people really think about like those kind of transitions that much. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it, it's it's uh, different dimensions of a problem because, like, uh, in, in a web app or in a web routing world, you're thinking about well, there's there's n number of entry points to to the application because you can start on any route, right? It is, Versus... It's more complicated than that too, right? Like, um, what's an example? Like, for example, Instagram. Uh, hmm. I don't know who uses Instagram here, but uh, basically. <laughs> It's not just back and forth, right? When you think about the web and the history on the web, you think about can I go back and go forward? That's it. Mm -hmm. But on the mobile app, like you can actually think about like if the screens were laid out left to right or even top to bottom, which mm -hmm. part like when you go back, which part does it go back to? Right? 
does it go yeah. back to the previous screen and is the previous screen on the left or is it on the right so there's different ways you can push a screen down on a mobile app and even mm. like if the user is kind of pressing down the app and they they do um what's that gesture called where they kind of swipe a bit and then they can peek at what's coming what uh screen is next or before like mm-hmm. that kind of consideration doesn't exist on the web at, at least not i'm aware of like people don't think about that but on mobile if your app doesn't do that then like it's wrong like it's not a native app because you're oh, basically trying to port uh, a web app into a native world whereas you should be thinking about how do i build a proper web app right interesting yeah i, I had thought about that really so <laughs> i guess i'm not on instagram <laughs> enough <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting piece. I remember um, I was doing I did some stuff with Android back in uh, back in college, and this was like in Java, not in JavaScript. But um, I remember there was like a, the concept of the stack, where you could actually have your different views stacked on top of each other, and as you closed one out, you would you know go back, you'd pop it off the stack, and you'd go back to whatever screen you had been to before. Mm-hmm. I think the back and forward. Uh, I think there was a forward at that time too. They kind of like mapped to the stack as well. Um, so. Yeah, I think the forward button is gone. Like, I yeah, I, I think my it. phone only has the back button now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened to it, but <laughs> I imagine that was fundamental change for for a lot of developers. And there's but yeah, a lot so, of people that can make mistake there, right? Like some hmm. apps, and you notice this if you open an app and you go back and exit right away. Uh, hmm. Someone messed up. They probably just read a tutorial, <laughs> copy pasted on some code, and they didn't consider what the back actually meant. And it actually exited the application by accident. Um, there's gotcha. a lot of nuance that goes on there. Yeah, that's interesting. A lot of nuance I, I guess I haven't had much exposure to, but that's that's really cool to think about and the different considerations for the routing. So I guess it, like, it kind of gets to a full... Uh, uh, <laughs> a, a full... Uh, you know, strategy for routing that maybe you want to differ between the two. Um, I see a comment here. Uh, please give us a sign that Jeff has kidnapped you. Reports this need to work. No, uh, <laughs> I'm doing it of my own volition. Jeff, Jeff is paying me, but <laughs> yeah, he, he did. Uh, he did put up his pictures uh, in the background. I put oh, up I, one I, of. I didn't notice he had more pictures of Jeff. Yeah, so I put up the one with Victor, and Jeff got a little jealous. So he oh. got a really big one and put it up. Uh, it was actually in the middle of one of my meetings too. So that was that was kind of a funny thing to do. <laughs> but but yeah, thanks for thanks for the comment. And you know, I'll I'll bring that up to Jeff. <laughs> we'll see what he says. But yeah, the more, um, the more pictures you have. The higher your salary is. Basically. I know, I know. If there's a direct <laughs> correlation between the two, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So so in addition to routing, so that that's kind of like one uh, realm that it sounds like we need like separate solution for for the two. Maybe like we said, maybe there's a way we could unify those strategies across it. But um, uh, that's one consideration I think we need to take into account, especially there being significant differences between like how routing would play out between the two different platforms. Um, another piece I thought was interesting was the material design library. So this kind of goes back to the UI pieces, right? Because you need different UI for, for native versus web. Um, and I imagine with material, um, I, I'm not familiar with React Native Paper, but I imagine you can get to something kind of similar with the, the APIs between these, or at least um, so that their like, props look the same for the components. Yeah, um, do you, do you have more experience with them, Jack? The problem with like, you basically have to, if you're using material design, um, mm-hmm. you have to use MUI for web and paper for, for mobile. Uh, maybe someone out there has try and bridge it too, but mm-hmm. like when it comes to APIs, they are just pretty different. Oh, okay. For example, on, on, on the web, you don't think about presses as much or gestures. On mobile, you'd consider that a lot. Like a lot yeah. of React Native APIs to deal with gestures and uh, pressable areas and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I haven't used Paper with React Native Web. Uh, it may work, but I'm not. I'm not too sure. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've, so in the web, it's like if you need gestures, you like import Hammer JS, right? <laughs> then, mm-hmm. then maybe you could like put in like the one or two gestures you care about. 
I, I guess with, with native, the, the like you said, the gestures are much more important just because that's that's kind of the the, the way you're looking yeah, at it. There's a lot of things that are natural to the mobile app. Whereas mm -hmm. like when you're using a mouse or a trackpad, you're not going to perform certain gestures the same way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I think with the... Um, I, th I think with the mouse, um, at least whenever I throw like Chrome yeah. into the the web view, where they they give you like the the circle instead of your mouse, I always feel yeah. lost without my right click, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I imagine like just just the 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 differences between those um, seem seems like a pretty fast chasm. Yeah. Oh, um, well, one thing we didn't cover yet. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure anyone who's used React Native they already know this, but for anyone who hasn't. I think the reason why so many people gravitate to uh, web apps and like a web dev web app dev experience is this is so much nicer compared to traditional desktop app or uh, mobile apps, right? Like mm. I type something, something gets a uh, hot refresh right away or fast refresh right away. I don't have to wait for a compile or anything. Uh, React Native gives you the same experience on native. So, uh, so yeah, I think the starting point for a lot of companies is like, let's build out the web app because it's faster to iterate. It's uh, easier to develop against. And then we'll right. try and port it to web app. Oh, sorry, the uh, the native app. Yeah. I think with React Native, it allows you the ability to say like, let's actually just think about the React Native app or the native app uh, first. And then the experience of developing against that is just as nice as a web app. And then you can mm. port it to the web app using whatever strategy you want to do. Uh, whether it's like Emily strategy where you um, share the domain but nothing else, maybe use React Native Web to share the UI even. Um, you can figure it out from there. That's really cool. Yeah, I, 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 w I had always assumed that one of the, one of the uh, allures of React Native is just um, like the, the cost of the development, right? Like JS developers are in general cheaper than I think native uh, developers by a good amount. So, um, mm -hmm. I think I think it's also like the way I think of it coming from the JavaScript world primarily too is like, well, now I can take the stuff I know and just bring it to native as well. But right. I hadn't really considered. I, I'm not familiar with how native works other than knowing it's kind of a pain, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> you you got to do you got to manage the differences between Android and and uh, and Mac, and if you want to to unify those you either need to do something like flutter or uh react right. native i guess right. or you have to do your own uh what is it like swift for ios and then right. uh like kotlin for for your android and you gotta keep those in sync and that's that seems like a whole other piece of <laughs> unfortunate stuff so so yeah like react native being a way to to unify those two while still uh, like you mentioned, bringing in a dimension of like the the ease of the experience, uh, where mm -hmm. it's just as easy as writing a web app. Yeah, um, and it, it maybe it gets into more advanced use cases, but uh, mm -hmm. like most mobile apps, you can't update unless a user actually goes to the store and updates it. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, with React Native app, you can technically update if you only have changes to a JS bundle. Uh, mm -hmm. You could update your app. Now, if you obviously change something on the native side, you have to get them to redownload that binary. But uh, gotcha. for the most part, if you just want to change other few things, you could try to push down just the JS UI, UI changes without them having to update it. Uh, Interesting. There used to be something from Microsoft. I don't know if it's still active. I think it's called like Pusher or something where they try to push these changes down. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I even considered that. <laughs> like, I guess it's a it's a whole thing to get people to upgrade, right? So if you can if you can get uh, if you can get some upgrades in there without actually upgrading the binary itself, that seems like but a I huge. Think, think about Netflix. Like, uh huh. You, it basically doesn't need to update, right? It's just kind of yeah, like yeah. Better. Every time a new movie happens, you don't need to update the app, right? You just get you just get new new data down. Yeah. Even when they change up the UI and stuff, you're not like updating the native app. Oh yeah, yeah. So you can also push code to your app via Firebase. Firebase, I, mm. I love Firebase. That does too. <laughs> so, yeah, very cool to see that. Um, listen, we got we got like five minutes left. Um, uh, 
for for people watching, be sure to check out uh, Emily's uh, blog on you know and, and the repo as well. It's uh, it's pretty cool to see all the all the work she did, and it's kind of a cool app too. I'm not I'm not familiar with uh, what is a Studio Ghibli, but it looks it looks cool. You don't know? Oh my god! <laughs> is, this, is this like Spirited Away and everything? Yeah, like, like Totoro, okay. Spirited Away, uh, you know, House Moving Castle, a bunch of things. Yeah. This, this is not a part of my childhood, unfortunately, but yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is cool to see them. They, they look, it's, it looks very artistic and very, uh, yeah, very nice. But, um, but yeah, I, wa I wanted to take the last five minutes just to see Jack, if we could talk a little bit about like uh future for NX and react and, uh, react native integration. I think there's, um, we, we have a bullet here from, from Yuri about Expo stuff, too, mm -hmm. in the future. Is that is that something you can talk about? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Emily can speak to Expo a lot more than me. Like, I, I mm -hmm. help her uh, with a few things here and there, but she's really the one leading that. Um, but Expo is another, I guess, layer on top of React Native. So if you use mm -hmm. React Native, you basically can choose, do you want to use Expo or do you want to use React Native playing? Um, hmm. The advantage of Expo is that it handles a lot of things for you. Even like if you push your app to the Expo app, you can actually share your app with people uh, remotely without having to like compile and give them like a sample of the APK or whatever package uh, binary you're using. Uh, so they provide a lot of cool things around that. They even they have a build pipeline, so like you can build and like deploy your mobile app to to devices or um, they manage all that pipeline for you. Um, so if you buy into the Expo, I guess, I don't know what you call it, meta framework? On, or <laughs> the Expo tooling, maybe. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, it, it is something we're supporting, and it's part of the NX Labs repo right now. Um, cool. So it's not in the main model repo, but in the Labs one. Cool. So something we're experimenting with, hopefully we'll get out. Yeah, and well, we do know one company that's using it. Um, yeah, we're, oh, cool. Basically, trying to replace there was a really good community plugin for Expo for a while, but as you know, it's, it's hard to maintain plugins. So yeah, um, so we're basically taking a lot of the same ideas, but just making it a little bit more maintained, adding additional um, things on top of it. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. So so Expo is kind of by by putting Expo on top of React Native, we we get some of the benefits you talked about, like being able to share. Uh, sh share progress with with other people and and share uh, well uh, manage the builds and stuff like that. Is, it, uh, is that is that most of what you get from Expo? Like, is that is that what you would use Expo for, or is, um, what else would you use Expo for? So Expo basically hides a lot of the lower level details from you. Like you're building okay. a native app, but unlike like a plain React native app, you're thinking more in like a platform agnostic way, I would mm. put it. And granted, I haven't used it in a long, long, long time, except for like playing around with it for demos and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, if you're just building a normal application, you don't have a lot of like crazy um, native requirements, you can probably use Expo and it's a lot better experience because they handle all the tough parts for you. And all the platform, everything, like all the pipelines, all the tooling around it, it's already done for you. Versus mm -hmm. like a React Native app, you probably have to do a little bit more, or at least you have to think about a little bit more than an Expo app. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, very cool. It's, well, Jack, it's been great to, ha to have you on, chat about React Native a little bit. Uh, cool to see <laughs> see the work y'all are doing over there. and. Uh, Looks like some some interesting stuff coming down the pipelines for mm -hmm. for an X support as well. So, um, I'm I'm excited to hear about it and excited to try it out a little bit more uh, with my side projects if I get a chance. And uh, yeah, it's the with NX the the there's always this allure of the code sharing and the the mm -hmm. ability to support the multiple platforms. And that's that's always been I feel like the holy grail of mm -hmm. sort of the world we're in. Like right it right at once and you get a web app and you get a desktop app and you get a mobile app and all these things. And it seems like NX can get you really close to that. So being able to dive into that and see like where the challenges come up when the rubber hits the road and seeing sort of the uh you know the the work that Emily put out there and ha where where those where things can't be shared and where they can. Um, 
it was a mm-hmm. really cool thing to to go through that article and to her code base to see all that so yeah, yeah uh for sure. thanks for joining us and uh everyone everyone out there thanks for uh chilling with us and uh yeah we will be back in a couple of weeks i think we have leo coming on we're going to talk about uh astro uh and deploying uh angular apps with astro and stuff like that or so i'm i'm looking forward to it and uh yeah <laughs> thanks thanks again jack and uh yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see you all next time bye now